Welcome to this podcast on electronic communications or e-communications. This will involve a discussion about questions related to networks and the internet in computing. These topics are from question 3 of the 2024 Information Technology or IT November Theory Exam. There are three ways that you can engage with the content of this podcast. If you want to test your knowledge, then download the questions covered in the video. There's a link to the PDF in the video description. Then go and attempt these questions and then come back and listen and compare your answers with the discussion. Or if you want to learn new information, then listen to the discussion first. Then download the questions that we mentioned earlier that is in the video description and test yourself to see how much you remember from the discussion. Or you can simply enjoy the discussion and learn more about electronic communications. And now let's hear what our podcasters have to say about networks and the internet. Welcome to the Deep Dive, your shortcut to being well informed. We take a pile of research notes, articles, and boil it all down to the key stuff you need to know. Today, we're plunging into something fundamental, uh, the infrastructure that makes pretty much everything we do online possible. We're talking computer networks and internet technologies. Our mission here is, well, pretty clear. We want to unravel key ideas, things like different kinds of networks, how information actually zips around, and you know the clever tech behind your online life. Especially if you're taking computer classes or you're just curious about how this digital world ticks, this deep dive is definitely for you. We're aiming for those aha moments, building solid understanding without uh, drowning you in jargon. Let's demystify that digital backbone. Okay, so let's kick things off right at the start. Now, the basic idea of a network, I mean, at its heart, it's just devices connected, right? But these connections can cover tiny areas or, well, huge ones, like home Wi-Fi versus maybe a whole university. What's a classic example of a network? Maybe using cables that covers a specific limited area, like, say, a sports stadium or maybe a school building. Yeah, that's a great starting point. Uh, we categorize networks based on, well, how far they reach physically for that limited area you mentioned, a building, a campus, maybe that stadium, we're talking about a LAN, that's a local area network. These are typically uh, cabled networks. They're built for speed and efficiency just within that specific space, yeah. letting all the connected devices talk really quickly. Right, LAN. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All right, let's switch gears a bit from the physical layout to... Uh, the speed, network speed. We hear terms like fast internet all the time, but what are we actually measuring? What's bandwidth and how does it relate to how fast things feel? Bandwidth is essentially the capacity of your connection. It's the maximum amount of data that can travel over that network in a set amount of time. Think of it like a highway. A wider highway can handle more cars or data at the same time. So higher bandwidth usually means more data per second. And how do we measure that? What are the units for this digital highway's width? We measure it in bits per second. So you'll see B piece, then KB piece for kilobits, ME piece for megabits, and GB piece for gigabits per second. When your internet provider talks speed, they usually mean MPs, megabits per second. That gives you a good idea of download or upload speed. But uh, it's important to remember bandwidth is like the highway's width. There's also latency. Latency is the time it takes for, say, one car to get from point A to point B. You could have a massive highway, but if the travel time itself is really slow, things like video calls or gaming can still feel sluggish. That's a really useful distinction, not just how much, but how fast it gets there. So you've got the LAN set up physically. What about getting devices to actually talk to each other? How does my laptop know to send something to the printer down the hall and not, I don't know, the smart fridge? That's where the IP address comes in, isn't it? Exactly. Think of an IP address like um, a unique street address for every single device on that network. Your printer, your phone, a server, everything gets one. Just like the post office needs an address to deliver a letter, the network needs that IP address to route data packets to the right device. Without it, honestly, it'd just be a chaos. And, you know, it's interesting because they're not just simple numbers anymore. We have older ones, IPv4, and now the much, much bigger IPv6 system, which is crucial because we keep adding more and more devices to the Internet. Got it. Like a digital postal code. Makes perfect sense. Okay, so when you're actually designing these networks, the physical layout, how things are arranged, the topology that's really important, one common layout is the star topology. Can you unpack why that's such a good and new all frequently used setup, especially for places like that stadium or even just a typical office? Well, thinking about reliability and managing the network, a star topology is just incredibly practical. It's very resilient, which is why you see it everywhere. The basic idea is simple. Every device connects directly to a central point. Usually that's a network switch. 
Think of the switch as like a smart traffic controller. It sends data only to the device it's meant for, not just blasting it out everywhere like older tech used to. That's much more efficient and uh, more secure too. And this layout gives you some key advantages. First off, if the connection between just one device and that central switch breaks, uh -huh. all the other devices can still talk to the network, the whole thing doesn't crash, that's huge for places that need to stay online, like hospitals. Plus, troubleshooting gets way easier. Each device has its own dedicated cable going straight to the switch. Right, so you can isolate the problem quickly. Exactly. And adding or removing devices, super easy. Just plug it in or unplug it from the switch. It's efficient, it scales well, and data gets a direct path. It doesn't have to hop through other devices. So it's really about building for reliability and making maintenance easier. That definitely shows why topology is a big deal in network design. Okay, now here's where it gets really interesting for most of us daily. Wireless connections. We're not always plugging in cables anymore. What are the main technologies we use every day to connect wirelessly? What are they typically for? Ah, uh, there's quite a mix for wireless connections, each good for different things. The big one everyone knows is Wi-Fi. That's your standard for home and office internet. Then you've got Bluetooth. That's for really short distances, you know, connecting headphones, speakers, maybe a mouse. For places further out, especially rural areas, satellite internet is an option. And of course, cellular. Things like GPRS, Edge, 3G, 4G, and now 5G. That's the backbone for our mobile devices, always getting faster, handling more data for text, calls, video, everything on the go. There was also WiMAX, less common now, but it aimed for citywide wireless internet back in the day. Wow, it's kind of amazing how many invisible signals are carrying our stuff around. So, okay, someone wants to get on a Wi-Fi network, their laptop or phone. How do they actually connect? Seems simple, but what's happening? Yeah, from the user side, it's meant to be super simple. Your device scans for nearby networks. You see the name you recognize, that's called the SSID, and you select it. Then usually you type in the password, the network key, for security. Once that's verified, your device gets an IP address, often automatically, using something called DHCP, and bam, you're connected. Simple enough. Okay, let's imagine a common problem. You need to get online for school, but your laptop's built-in Wi-Fi adapter is busted just won't connect. Is there like an external gadget or peripheral device that can get the laptop connected wirelessly without needing a big repair? That's a really practical question. And yes, absolutely. You can easily use a USB Wi-Fi adapter. It's a small, usually pretty cheap device. You just plug it into a USB port on the laptop. It acts like an external wireless card, basically letting your laptop connect just fine, bypassing the broken internal one. It's a great quick fix. That is such a neat, useful solution really shows how adaptable this tech can be. All right, let's have it again. Let's talk websites, something we all use constantly. Imagine a website for a big marathon event. Participants want to upload photos, videos, maybe share their race experiences. Why would a static website be totally wrong for that kind of interactive site? What's the difference? Right, so a static website is, well, static. It's fixed. It's basically a bunch of pre-made HTML pages. They only change if a developer goes in and manually updates the files. They're fine for simple stuff, like an online brochure where information doesn't change often, but for that marathon site, where users need to upload things, maybe have profiles, interact, a static site just can't do that. It can't handle user input, store data dynamically, or offer that real-time interaction. So it's like a read-only thing. Pretty much. For interactivity, user uploads, all that stuff, you need a dynamic website. These use scripting on the server and databases to generate content as needed, allowing for all that user engagement. That makes the difference crystal clear, like a printed flyer versus a busy online forum. Okay, speaking of websites, we always see those pop-ups asking us to accept cookies. Mm -hmm. So what's the deal with those? What exactly is a cookie? And is there actually any benefit for us, the users, besides, you know, being tracked? Okay, cookies. A cookie is actually a tiny text file. That's it. The website you visit saves it onto your device, your computer, or phone. Its main job is to store little bits of information about your visit, your activities, maybe preferences you set, your settings, browsing history for that site. It's just data, not a program. Right. And while people often focus on the tracking aspect, cookies can genuinely make browsing better. They remember if you're logged in so you don't have to sign in constantly. They can pre-fill forms with your info, saving time. Think about a site remembering your language preference or what's in your shopping cart. That's cookies. They also help with personalized ads and recommendations showing you things you might actually be interested in. So yes, they track, but they also streamline things and tailor the experience, which can be helpful. Okay, so not entirely evil. They do have a convenience factor helping make things smoother online. That's a good perspective. 
Now, another thing we see everywhere, especially at events, QR codes. Those little black and white square patterns on tickets, posters, menus. What is that image actually called? Like the one on a marathon ticket? That square pattern is a QR code. Stands for quick response code. And why use a QR code on, say, a spectator's ticket for a big event like this marathon? What are the upsides? Oh, there are quite a few benefits, especially for big events. First, it allows for a contactless entry. Stand and go, no physical touching needed. That became huge recently. Second, security is better. Each code can be unique to each ticket, and it's not readable by humans, making it much harder to fake compared to just a number or a simple barcode. They can check it in real time at the gate. Hmm, makes sense. It also makes organizing things way easier. Standing is fast, so gates open quickly, queues move faster, less bottlenecking. And for the person attending, it's super convenient. Save the ticket on your phone, no printing needed, saves paper, and you're less likely to lose it than a paper ticket. Plus, a QR code can hold more information or link out to stuff like event maps, schedules, maybe emergency info, all just a quick stan away. It really is amazing how these simple looking things like cookies and QR codes are so deeply woven into everything we do online and off, yeah. often without us even noticing the tech behind them. Okay, let's wrap up this deep dive by talking about streaming, something many of us do all the time. Events like our marathon example often offer both a live stream and uh, on-demand viewing later. What's the basic difference there? Why offer both? Yeah, the difference is pretty straightforward. Live streaming is broadcasting in real time. It's happening now, like watching a game as it's played or a live news report. There's that immediate feeling. Viewing on demand, though, means the content is already recorded and stored. You can access it whenever you want, like picking a movie on Netflix or watching marathon highlights the next day. Events offer both options just to suit different people. Some want that live excitement. Others want the flexibility to watch whenever. Right. Now, we've all been there. You're trying to watch something important, maybe that live stream, and boom. The server just stops responding. The video uh, spins. The site won't load. There's a specific kind of attack that causes this, right? Where tons of computers flood a server with requests all at once. What's that called? Ah, yes. That specific type of attack, designed purely to make a service unavailable by overwhelming it with traffic, is called a DDoS. That stands for Distributed Denial of Service. Imagine uh, thousands of fake runners trying to suddenly jam the starting line of the marathon all at once. Legitimate runners can't get through. That's basically what a DDoS attack does to a server swamps it so real users can't connect. DDoS. Yeah. Got it. So how do companies, streaming services, websites protect themselves? How do they stop their servers from just collapsing under that kind of traffic, whether it's mm -hmm. a malicious attack or just you know, huge legitimate demand for something popular. That's a massive challenge, dealing with potentially overwhelming traffic. They use a layered approach, really. One thing is to simply increase the bandwidth, widen that digital highway we talked about so it can handle more traffic volume. They can also upgrade the networking infrastructure, faster routers, better switches, things that can process requests more quickly. Implementing a queuing system can also help during huge peaks, like letting people into a waiting room instead of letting everyone crash the gate at once. Other key things? include managing server resources smartly, using robust security tools like firewalls and systems that detect attacks, applying access restrictions might be needed sometimes. Bot prevention is crucial because many DDoS attacks use automated bots. And just generally reducing the attack surface, basically minimizing the ways attackers can target the system, plus using sophisticated traffic management systems that can spot and filter out bad traffic are all part of the defense. And when they do all this, how does it affect us as users? Do we notice these defenses? Ideally, you don't notice them at all. That's the whole point. When all those defenses work well, your stream is smooth, the website loads instantly, your connection feels solid, even if there's huge demand or even an attack happening behind the scenes. It's only when those systems fail or get overwhelmed that you experience the lag, the buffering, the site being down. So good prevention is really all about ensuring that smooth, reliable experience for you. Wow, okay. What a journey. We really covered a lot today from the basics of networks, LANs, those star topologies, to understanding bandwidth and all the wireless tech connecting us. Then we got into dynamic websites, demystified cookies a bit, saw the usefulness of QR codes, and finished up with streaming, live versus on demand, and the critical defenses against things like DDoS attacks. Lots of great nuggets there. Absolutely, and I think the key takeaway is that understanding these building blocks isn't just academic. It helps you grasp how this digital world we live in actually functions. It makes you a more informed user, you know. Totally agree. And for you listening, especially if you're getting into computer studies, we really hope this deep dive brought some clarity. Maybe a new way to look at the tech you use every single day. 
Think about how these things networks, web tech, they're always changing, always evolving, shaping what's next. Keep an eye out for these concepts in action. So here's a final thought. Next time you connect to Wi-Fi without second thought, or scan a QR code, or stream a video, just pause for a second. Consider all those complex systems, all that clever design, working invisibly just to make it happen smoothly for you. What other unseen technologies are shaping your digital world every day? Keep digging, keep learning, and we'll catch you on the next Deep Dive. Just a reminder to support the channel by clicking on that subscribe button and leaving a like, leaving a comment. We'd really be happy if you do that. It helps promote the channel. Also, we are on TikTok at Mr. Long Education. And remember, don't do it the long way, do it the Mr. Long way.